Is it stressful? <laughs> yes, yes, yes it is. Hello! Welcome back to Riding With Re. As you will have seen from the title of this video, I am officially on the lookout for my first horse. It's almost a year since I started getting right back into horses and now I am ready to look for a horse of my own, which is a fantastic idea in the middle of a global pandemic. I have a bunch of questions from you here on Instagram about the buying process, so maybe it's worth me telling you a little bit about what I'm looking for, how I got to this point. So as I said, I've been sharing and loaning for like a year now and decided that this was a point that um, I'm ready to find a horse of my own. I am looking for a horse who is 16 to 17 hands, who is a gelding preferably, who is about 8 years old, 6 to 10 years old is great for me, um, who can do kind of all rounder activities, so riding club, unaffiliated competitions, and also I would like to go and have a go at BE this year, British eventing, so I would like a horse that has done a little bit of that, or at least has the potential to do something like that. I can't really see myself going much above BE 90, maybe BE 100, so I don't need a like badminton winner, but I I think it would be nice if there's something that has done a little bit beforehand to help me out. Okay, let me go into these questions. Let's talk about the process during COVID. This is actually a really good question because yeah, this is not the best time to be looking for a horse in the middle of a global pandemic. It has definitely changed things. And I think the one thing that no one is talking about, at least not that I've seen apart from like closed Facebook groups, is the prices. The prices during COVID are insane. Horses that would cost between like three and 5K are now up for like seven, eight, nine and like horses are going really quickly as well like this was all sort of prior to this national lockdown but I would message about a horse who had been up for like a day or a couple of hours on horse quest or whatever and they would have sold immediately and the good ones are going really really quickly so whereas maybe like a year ago you would be able to go and see a horse and then maybe get your coach or someone else to look at them or try them again or take them for a hack or whatever I feel like now that's just not an option because the horses are going so quickly that you just you don't have chance so yeah the process is very different during COVID and I also had questions around would I be looking at horses during lockdown and honestly I don't know the information that we're getting from the government is changing all the time first it was tears then it was national lockdown by the time I put this out it might be something else it's really difficult I've certainly narrowed the location pool that I was looking at originally I was sort of looking at like two hours in any direction and now I'm really just looking very very locally but whether or not I'll actually take any of those through to viewing stage is to be seen every single set that I've spoken to is still doing viewings and there's been a lot of debates on a lot of Facebook groups about whether buyers should or shouldn't be going I mean whether it's essential travel the BHS does have guidance on the website which does talk about viewing horses and just says about the COVID guidelines that should be in pay place and the sellers that I have spoken to have asked for COVID restrictions to be in place masks social distancing etc I know this is probably not going to be a very popular opinion but I do feel for the sellers especially when it is their job to buy and sell horses but I think it's a judgment cool thing I think you have to decide whether it's safe and I still haven't made up my mind whether I am going to do viewings or not I think in the national lockdown it does feel a little bit different to how it did when we were in a we were in a tiered system and you were viewing horses in the same tier so TBC but I will I'll keep you updated how do you figure out the criteria for choosing a horse this is a good question I always start from like what do I know that I need so for example I know that I can't ride a horse that's smaller than 15.3 because they would be too small for me I know that if I ride a horse bigger than 17.1 it's going to be too big so I think you can start with the real basics and then when it comes to age I know that I don't really want a horse who's under six because that is a lot more of a challenge to take on and you have to have a lot more experience with younger horses so I know that I don't really want to go younger really than a five-year-old but I also know that I don't want to go much older really than 10 I mean eight would be perfect but if I go older than 10 then I have to think about what that horse's future looks like in six years in 10 years and how much they'll be able to do because some horses retire in their teen years some horses are still competing when they're 25 you know it's really difficult and it's hard to know but I know that whatever horse I buy I want to be competing and I want to grow with them and it would be a real shame if that horse was then retiring in the next sort of five years because that changes your dynamic it changes what you're able to do and I really don't want to sell an older horse I wouldn't want to sell the horse that I buy I want it to be my forever horse so then you have to start 
start thinking about cost of retirement livery and you're still paying for a horse that you can't ride. And I do think that horses deserve that. They do deserve to have the retirement after they've looked after us for so long. The more that you do the process and you see adverts, the more that you realise what you are and aren't willing to compromise on. So I know that I don't want an X race horse and I don't want a thoroughbred. And that isn't because I'm being really snobby about it. It's just that X race horses are a lot to retrain. They require a lot of experience and a lot of time and patience. They've been taught to run, like that's their job. And I can deal with a lot of things and I'm happy to help a horse get on with things, but I really hate horses who bolt. I'm not a fan of horses who are strong. So, you know, to then put myself on an X race horse isn't gonna be the smartest thing in the world. And I don't like thoroughbreds because I just like something with a little bit more bone. I like to have something a little bit bigger underneath me. I don't, I'm not really a fan of the thoroughbred brain and how they think they're very hot and sharp all the time. I don't really like their feet. I find that they can be quite challenging to take care of. They're quite expensive because they often have problems with their feet, they lose their shoes, their legs some can sometimes have problems. I just find them a little bit more sort of flimsy than other types of horses and they're just not my favourite breed. So that's why I've sort of said no to thoroughbreds and ex-racers, but everything else I'm pretty open to. Would you ever consider a stallion? Absolutely not. No, not for me. Like it's not, it's not gonna happen for me. I have absolutely no experience with stallions. I don't know what they need. I've never ridden one. They require a lot of experience. I think they're a challenge. They can be amazing, don't get me wrong. I know people that have incredible dressage stallions and they are just amazing, but they can be really challenging to put on livery because a lot of yards won't have stallions. So you put yourself in a little bit of a box if you don't know where they're gonna live. They can be difficult to take out to shows because some show grounds don't want stallions. They can require specific types of like stabling, specific types of partitions when they're traveling. You always have to think about if there's mares around. It's just, for me, it is a challenge that is just adding an extra barrier to what is already challenging. I just, I don't think a stallion is for me. And equally, someone asked if I would ever get a youngster. I would drop down to a five-year-old, but only because I know that I have a coach who's amazing. And if I needed them to have a bit more education, I have someone I can put them with that they can be ridden by and that it'll all be fine. I just, I know my own limits and I just don't have the experience with young horses to warrant buying myself something that was unbroken or a four-year-old or, you know, something that needs a lot more help and work. I'm much more comfortable getting a horse who is young, but has done a little bit, has been produced really nicely and given time to grow. And then working with my coach and that horse to kind of grow together, like I know my limits. Someone asked like, how do you have a realistic criteria and know what you're capable of? And I think, I think you'll end up being pretty honest with yourself actually. Like when you start looking at adverts and you get down the road of thinking about actually viewing that horse, if you turn up to the yard, where that horse viewing is and you're terrified to get on it like that to me is a sign that like this is maybe not the horse for you and my instructor said something really great actually before our first viewing which was if you get on board and they make you feel like a great rider and you feel like fantastic and you want to sit up tall and you just feel like you're in control and it's great then they're probably, we're on the right track in terms of finding the right horse for you. But if you get on board and they make you feel like you can't ride and you, you've never felt like such a bad rider and they're out of control and you don't know what you're doing, then they're probably not the right horse for you. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily the difference between a good rider and a bad rider. It's just that horses are just like humans and it takes a long time to find a good partnership. So I think you'll discover pretty quickly what your, your absolute yeses and nos are. I originally was looking at some horses who were like seven one. But then when I was looking at adverts that combined a 17 one with a six year old, suddenly not only do you have a really quite a big horse, you also have a young horse who's still growing. And that combination is really quite challenging. You have a lot of horse there to deal with. Whereas for example, I, I looked at a really nice 15 three who really is smaller than I would normally look at, but he was five, which means he's gonna keep growing. And actually having something slightly smaller who is slightly more green is just easier to deal with. So I think you'll find your sliding scales of what you are and aren't able aren't able to kind of compromise on. What are red flags in adverts? I had a few questions around this. Like what are the things that you read that you're just like, oh, not for me. I'm learning quickly through 
my coach and, and my friends who I'm sending adverts to that so much of buying horses is reading between the lines. You have to sort of question everything you read. Like if, if they put something in the advert, it's usually because it's quite prominent. So for example, if you see an advert that says not a novice ride can be forward, but never, never nasty or whatever, then if a seller is putting that that horse is forward, and they're not a novice ride, you're sort of like, how forward? Because it's not always a case of like, they just want to put off novices and that horse is just, it's just a blood horse and it has, you know, has a lot of energy and it's an athlete and it moves. It could be actually what that means is that horse is really strong or very, very keen. But you just have to be really careful with that kind of thing. Red flags for me are unfortunately like prior injuries. I've had a couple of horses that I've spoken to the owners about or gone to view and they've ended up having had like kissing spine surgery or, you know, something like that and that kind of stuff is really challenging because if it were my horse who I'd bought and they needed kissing spine surgery I would do it and I would do the rehab and I would do the work afterwards but to buy a horse who already has those problems and things that you need to take care of is a really difficult challenge to take on especially at the price bracket that I'm looking at like I'm looking at kind of high four figures so these are not cheap cheap horses and when you're buying a problem you are taking on potentially a lot of vet bills in the future the other thing that comes up fairly often on adverts is sarcoids this is a really challenging one and i had to speak to my coach about this because i didn't know that much about sarcoids enough to make an informed judgment but sarcoids are really hard to remove it's very hard to insure a horse for sarcoids once they've had them and they can cause quite a lot of problems they can be really hard to remove once they've had one they can often get more and they can eventually stop a horse's working life so it's such a gamble if you do buy a horse with sarcoids or a horse that's had a sarcoid trying to weigh up whether or not that's going to be a problem for you in the future is is difficult the other red flags are if a horse is say eight years old but they've been started really late i think that can be a challenge if i see a horse who is eight or nine in an advert and they are really overbent in the flat work it's not great my instructor i sent her i sent her a horse the other day actually that looked fantastic being jumping he was brilliant and then we looked at the flat work videos and he was bent uh, overbent and you know her reaction was the problem is once they learn to break at the neck and overbend like that they're very difficult to bring back and if they're sort of mouthing at the bit they don't look very comfortable these are all things that can just be a bit of a red flag um and it's all a gamble like sometimes you just have to go and try a horse and be like oh yeah they're fine actually you don't know what's the rider and what's the horse anything where the rider is doing something on the approach to a fence like moving their hands a lot or trying to do something with the horse quietly or trying to keep the horse like tucked in those things are flags to me i also personally speaking i don't like to see horses being chased around a school loose schooled and jumped again and again and again especially when they're a little bit older doesn't feel necessary i understand when they're youngsters and they haven't been broken yet and you just want to see the scope but to see a horse i saw an advert of a horse the other day he was just going round and round and round and then the rider video they just jump the same big fence like 10 times and you just think is that necessary is it really and it, ju it just makes you think about the yard and the way that they are dealing with these horses and whether or not that's something you want to do again this is all stuff to take with a pinch of salt it just helps you build a picture um and then the tack that the horse is wearing in the video what bit have they got on if it's not a snaffle why is it not a snaffle it's sort of a, a nice thing on an advert to be able to say snaffle mouthed so you know they're not strong essentially so if they are wearing you know a pelham or something like that why if they're wearing a martingale i mean martingales are whatever a lot of horses wear those but anything that they're wearing in the video draw reins strong bits anything like that you sort of are like why 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 do they need that and that can be something to consider um again it's personal preference i know my ability level um i don't want a massive handful i don't want to overhorse myself so i am looking out for these things i had a lot of questions about whether or not i would take my coach with me to viewings absolutely the only time i wouldn't take my coach is if she was really really busy i might go and view a horse and then have her come look at it the next day or something if i really liked them maybe put down a deposit and so that they can't show it to other people but yes i would always take my coach i know that i can ride but i don't i don't know what i'm looking for when it comes to injuries and having my coach there she knows the questions to ask what is the process of buying from sort of beginning to end okay so i look a lot on horse quest that's where i'm spending a lot of my time um horse and hound classifieds and on facebook some people are tagging me on facebook a lot of my friends 
And then usually what you would do is you'd see the advert and then you would either call that person for a chat about the horse or you'd ask for videos. I always ask for videos first if there isn't one because I can see quite quickly whether or not I even want to continue the conversation. So what I do is I, I usually have conversations with people on WhatsApp. I will save their name as the reference number from Horse Quest, so ref and then the number so that I can find that horse later, which sounds really impersonal. But when you're having conversations with like 15 people in a day about different horses, you can lose track of who's who really, really, really really quickly so I just have the reference number so I can look that horse up on horse quest later and see who I'm talking about when we go in to have a conversation so I would ask for videos of that horse um, and because it's an all-rounder I really would want a horse at least doing jumping and working on the flat and if they have jumping show jumps and cross-country fences like that's even better some some sales videos have horses in the stables being tacked up um, hacking out like all of that stuff is really good to see just to get a sense of their temperament and then if I like the horse I would send it to my instructor my coach I might then send it to a couple of friends I have a couple of really experienced uh, horse people that I send stuff to um, get their opinion get their thoughts and if we like it I would either call up that person get some information about the horse and then send that information to my coach or my coach would do the phone call and typically that conversation might go something like you call them up you ask them how long they've had the horse where were they before what were they doing with the previous owner um why they're for sale are there any injuries that they've had in the past any reason they wouldn't pass the five stage vetting anything you should be aware of and then i would also use that moment to pull out any language on the advert that gave me pause so you say they're not a novice ride can you talk a little bit more about that you say that they had an injury last year or they have a scar on their leg can you tell me a little bit more about that that kind of thing and then you would go a bit deeper if you have further questions questions on injuries and whatever you might speak to the vet who did whatever the procedure was etc but I've also been trying hard to send my coach everything at once so sometimes I will send her all the information that the salesperson has sent me or the the seller a video of the horse and then a voice note of like this is what the conversation on the phone went like so that she has everything what type of vetting do you get the horse yeah i had a couple of questions about vetting i am going to do a five stage vetting for whatever horse i end up going down that road with not everyone does but the money that i'm spending like i said i would rather put aside hundreds for a vetting than spend thousands on a horse and then find out that they have an underlying issue which is gonna be a problem in the future a lot of people do um a stage two vetting i believe when they buy a horse just to do the basic checks but five stages i mean you can look it up online but they do a bunch of things with the horse they test their flexion they do trot ups they test their heart after exercise and at rest they listen to breathing like there's loads of things that they do i don't know the exact in and outs which is why i'm using a vetting because i don't know the answer to these but I know that I want to do a five stage vetting just to be 100% sure. Uh, I had a lot of questions actually about whether or not I would keep my current loan and have a horse of my own. No, I would just have the horse that I'm buying. And then in terms of where my, my new horse will live, they will live on the livery yard that I have been at the last few weeks and you will have seen the yard tour of. And actually I sort of think maybe I ought to do another yard tour because I missed a couple of things out that were quite nice. So perhaps I'll do another one with the new horse. We can go around and explore it together. A lot of you have asked what to look for at a viewing so I've actually asked my coach if she would be willing to do a video with me and her horse and just show us what she does when she looks at a viewing I think that would be quite helpful for you but in terms of an overarching idea of what happens at a viewing so you would turn up you say hello to the owner you go and see the horse the owner should really then let you in with the horse you can put the head collar on you can give them a groom essentially you're then seeing how they are in the stable and the first thing that i went to with hannah whilst we did that she was going around checking his teeth his eyes his legs his back and unfortunately when we were checking his back we found um, a kissing spine scar which hadn't been disclosed on the advert and hadn't been spoken about in any of the conversations. So that was a little bit of a deal breaker. But had we continued into that viewing, the owner would have then tacked the horse up for us and we would have continued to have chats with them. They would have then taken them in the arena and shown off the horse for us. So walk, trot, canter on each rein and jumped them if that's what you want to do, jumping. They should then ask really if there's anything that you want to see. So if you want to see the horse do a specific jump or jump with fillers or whatever, you can ask for that and be shown it. And then if you are comfortable, you then get on the horse. So at any point in the viewing process you should feel very comfortable to say actually this isn't the horse for me and I don't want to do that or whatever you can feel comfortable you don't have to get on but if you are 
you are liking the horse you should get on so then you would get on walk trot canter on each rein jump whatever you feel comfortable with i had a few questions from people asking how high should you jump are the are the owners quite instructional or can you do what you want and i asked these exact same questions to my coach by the way i'm not like i don't have all this knowledge i'm literally sharing what she shared with me when i asked her these questions so her answer was that you you should be able to really try out the horse however you want provided that you're not doing something dangerous but you should also feel comfortable to say, hey, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm trying this out for the first time or whatever. Or you know this horse better than I do. If there's something I'm doing that you think I could do, I could do differently to get a better tune out of them or whatever, then you should feel comfortable to have that open rapport with the owner. I think in general, you just want to do something really simple. You want to have a walk on each rein. You want to have a trot on each rein, a canter on each rein. You might want to do some circles, some bends, some changes of rein. When it comes to the jumping, you should just feel comfortable to do whatever you want. To be honest, if you really want to see the horse do a certain type and you're not there yet, you should feel comfortable asking the seller or whoever's riding the horse for you to jump that height for you and show you that that horse can do it because if that's something say i'm thinking one day i might want to go to b100 but i'm not there yet and i don't i'm not jumping that height yet i'm not comfortable with it on a brand new horse then i should feel comfortable asking the seller to jump that horse at b100 to show me that they're capable and then when the time comes two years down the line or whatever i'll, I'll jump that so you could just jump a cross pole and leave it at that i think personally for me I will jump a cross pole and then I'll jump a straight bar if I feel comfortable because I think sometimes when you put the fences up to a straight bar the horses can get more sort of sit up a bit more and be a bit more forward so that's what I'm gonna do oh and I forgot actually when we first arrive and the horse um we first look at the horse yes we would request a trot up that was a question I had from someone so we would ask the horse to trot away from us and, and back to us again and again if my coach wasn't there for that I would video it so that she could have a look at it and and be looking for the things because I don't nest I can see when a horse is lame obviously but I don't necessarily have all of the nuanced eyes to see certain things like when a horse is turning in etc so I would rely on my coach for that how do you know the horse is the one I'm worried about making the wrong decision and regretting it further down the line <sighs> it's a good question I don't think you ever know if the horse is the one you have to combine logic of like okay is this is this the type of horse for me as we spoke about earlier are they the right height the right age can they do the things that i need them to do and then i think if they're healthy they're happy they tick your boxes from a logistic point of view all you can do is go with your gut how you feel when you sit on that horse that is all that you can do if it's the wrong horse in the future you can sell it's not the ideal situation but it's also not the be all and end all there are so many adverts that i've seen of horses of people who've bought horses with the best of intentions and then actually found out that they've overhorsed themselves and that that horse isn't the right fit for them anymore and that's fine obviously you want to get it right the first time but if you don't it's okay it happens don't try and put too much pressure on your I also think there is a slight romanticization, which romanticization, is that a word? I don't know. Um, that happens, especially on YouTube of like buying the perfect horse and you know, this whole romantic experience of buying horses. And, and the reality is, yes, it's lovely and it is, it is exciting and it is amazing to have a horse of your own in the stable, but a lot of horse buying is quite logistical clinical devoid of emotion stuff you're checking if they're healthy and they're not dangerous and if you can actually ride them a lot of it isn't super romantic so i think there is a part of you that does also need to have a slight separation when you are when you are searching that yes you want them to be the one and i do it as well i see horses on horse quest and i imagine them in my stable i imagine them on my gopro videos i imagine their name and what their nickname would be and that is is all part and parcel of looking for horses it's really exciting but the other side of my brain is really firm in saying yes okay but is this the right horse for you for these reasons and i think i think that's that's all that you can do really how did you prepare financially did you save little and often have a lifestyle change or a very nice christmas bonus yes yeah, so i think i mentioned a few months ago that before i took uh, on a full loan i actually saved the amount it would cost to full loan for um for several months beforehand i did all of my budgets i worked out how much it would cost me to have this horse on full livery for the year and i've also thought about contingency plans so i have savings and i have savings for different things and horses is one of them but in the future if for example my job changed and my income went down or i lost my job or whatever my contingency plan is something like this so i'm on full livery right now if i really really needed to i could go to part livery 
or I could go to DIY. If I still couldn't manage the horse that I have, I could consider a sharer. I could consider putting my horse on full loan. There are a lot of steps I can take before I have to decide that I need to sell my horse because I can't afford them. And I think knowing that and being okay with that decision tree of like, this is how it might go, is something that is important to think about with a horse. I'm aware that when I buy a six-year-old, they're gonna be alive for the next 30 years. 20, 30 years, you know, hopefully. So then I've also thought about, well, how old will I be? I'll be 60 by the time this horse is 36 or whatever. What does this horse buying experience look like if we get married? What does it look like if we have children? What does it look like if we move away? What does it look like if I have to go abroad for a few months? These things are all things that I've thought about. So I have saved little and often to answer your question. And I've also made the decision in my head that this is where a lot of my money is going to go. I'm not super, I mean, no one's going out this year, are they? But I'm not a big like party goer. I don't drink a huge amount. I don't have loads of other big hobbies that take out. I don't have a nice fancy car. This is where a lot of my money is going and I've made my peace with that. It's always gonna be a decision that like, if you are gonna get a horse, there are a lot of other things that you will need to sacrifice. That's kind of where I landed when it came to the finances and the reality of buying a horse. Are you going to dealers or just private? I'm doing both. So it's not always clear as well when you are looking at horse quest ads and, and ads on, on various platforms, whether it's private or a dealer. And actually I've rang some people thinking they were dealers and actually they've been a private seller. So I'm looking at both. I know a lot of people locally that know local dealers and have bought from dealers. I do a lot of tracing back and thankfully a lot of dealers are on Facebook and I can see which of my friends have liked them. I can talk to them, find out if they've had a good or bad experience. There are ways to vet dealers. I don't. I think dealers do get a bad rap and yes, of course there are dodgy dealers and a lot of people do get scammed and it is a really, it is a big problem them, but I I don't think that's a reason to completely write them off. I think there are really, really good dealers of horses out there. So I'm looking at both personally. And also just from a logistical point of view, sometimes they have the best horses. You know, they go over to Ireland, they choose the ones they want, they bring them over, they produce them, and then they're ready to go. And if I were going to view a horse and I can call ahead and say, you know, say I'm gonna travel an hour, say we're not in the middle of a national lockdown and I have a horse that I wanna view, I can also call them and say, this is the criteria I'm after. Do you have any others? And then you might be able to try four or five horses in a day. And that is only ever gonna benefit you because even if you walk away with nothing, you walk away with a much stronger idea of what you want. So I think personally dealers can be really helpful. Private sellers are great. They tend to have a lot more history on the horse. They've obviously, usually they've had them for longer so they understand what the horse has done in the last few years, but I certainly wouldn't write off dealers. I actually think they can be quite great. What horse breeds are more expensive than others? I mean, this is kind of like how long is a piece of string, but in general, youngsters are usually cheaper because they're unbroken and they don't have all of the value of having been produced. X racers are cheaper usually because they need a lot of work to bring back into sort of like normal ridden life. So they tend to be quite cheap as well. Certain ponies are quite expensive. Connemaras are really, really sought after as like pony cub ponies. So they are quite expensive because they're just like fabulous jumpers and stuff. Warm bloods and sport horses, the type that I'm going after, they can be quite expensive. Um, but a lot of it honestly depends on their experience, on their breeding, on their age. You know, you could have one thoroughbred who has just come off the racetrack and is maybe one and a half thousand pounds. And then you could have another thoroughbred who was retrained from racing six years ago and has done amazing B stuff. And he could be like 15,000. So it's not necessarily a breed thing as much as it is a bloodline thing and an experience thing. So, you know, it's sort of, a, it's all relative. And same with cobs. You can have some cobs that are really cheap and have done hardly anything. And other cobs, you know, like super cobs who've done amazing stuff. I mean, just look at Mary Hackett and her horse. Obi, who she rides for someone. I mean, that horse is probably worth his weight in gold, you know. But you put him alongside another cob who's maybe been out in the year, out in the field for a year, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, it'd be completely different. Would you ever buy unseen? No. I know some people are, and I, I know a lot of people who buy unseen from Ireland and then have them over. It is not for me. It is not for me. I think it's a lot easier to buy unseen if they are young and they haven't been broken yet and you don't you can kind of do all of the process yourself and you you have the experience to do that but for me personally i couldn't do it i mean 
I want this to be my forever horse and my heart would be in my mouth. I just don't think you can be as thorough. And if you're buying a horse that's broken, how on earth can you know how it rides? Ride, good riders can hide so much on videos and I just, I know my ability and I, I just, I wouldn't want to end up overhorsing myself. It would break my heart to have picked the wrong ones. Would you ever go for a full loan again or would you get loan with a view to buy? I wouldn't full loan again. I don't think my heart can take it. I've, you know, I've ridden other people's horses my whole life and I just, it's time now. It's time now to get my own. I, I'm really excited about the whole process and I waking up every day knowing that you own a horse and they're yours and that's what I want. So I, I wouldn't do a full loan again, but I would, I would do a, a, a loan with a view to buy. I do think actually that can be really helpful. I was speaking to someone the other day about horse, which it fell through, but that was a loan with a view to buy. And I think it just helps. It gives you a trial period to see how you get on with the horse. It's much more realistic of like life. You get to see the horse in on all of their days, good and bad, and yours too, um, and, and see if they're right for you. So I think a loan with a view to buy can actually be really great. Um, but it, it comes with its own stresses, you know, of like not knowing quite what's going to happen. What if the horse is injured while they're with you, etc. So ideally, I would just find the horse I want and buy them there and then and then be, you know, start the journey with them. Is it stressful? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, it is. I scroll so many pages every day. I speak to so many people. My WhatsApp is full of, I told you that I, um, I name them by the reference number. When when we've had a conversation, I've decided they're not right or the horse is sold or whatever. I put a cross, a, a red cross next to their name. My WhatsApp is filled with reference numbers with crosses next to them. And that is is like, ugh, it's a lot to look at, you know? It's a, it's a lot. It's stressful when, you know, you email someone and the horse is sold. It's stressful when you ask for videos, you don't get any. Stressful when you get far down the line and you start imagining that horse on your yard and then you find out they had an injury or something happens. You know, it is stressful, but it's also fun. I've got a question here, which I think could be a lovely one to finish on, which is what's your favorite thing about the horse buying process? I think it's, it's knowing that when they arrive, you're gonna wake up every day and get to work with this amazing animal and the future idea of what our competitions will look like. I'm very excited about the chat, this channel. I mean, I, over the next few months, I hope that you can bear with it being less horsey while I find one. There were so many things I wanted to do last year that it, they're difficult to do when you don't own a horse. So I think I'm really excited about that. I'm so excited about shopping for everything. I mean, it's going to be really expensive and we'll get to that in another video. But, you know, I've been like looking at different rug types, rug liners colour coordination, um, what head colour I want, grooming brushes, like all these things are so exciting and if I wanted to go on a horsey holiday with him I could do that, like it's just, I'm so excited, I'm so so excited and the idea of being able to bond with a horse and know that you're gonna have them for your whole life, like one day I might have a child and I might be able to put them on the horse and like, I don't know, I might have friends and they might want to come down and see them, like all of that stuff, it's its all the emotional side of the horse buying process, it's the fun bit. I hope that you found this video useful and uh, I think I answered all of your questions and I'm sorry if I left anything out, there will be others. I'm, there will be lots of these conversations as we go along so I'll keep you posted. Thank you so much for watching this video and for being part of the Riding With Re community. We're looking for a horse everyone, it's very exciting. Um, I will see you next time and I thank you for watching, bye.